morning. Man, I like that song. That's one of them kind that gets you a speeding ticket right there. You know, it is sure awesome, and I do realize the message behind that song. It's the only thing that ever really made me want to change, and I, pray, I am so thankful for that. Uh, <clears throat> before we get started this morning, there's something I want to encourage you. Uh, our sign-up sheet is out in the foyer for Children's Church, and I was asked to elaborate on this a little bit. And, and uh, Children's Church is, a, is a, our Children's Church has been blessed, man. We have been blessed, and these kids are rolling down in the basement, and they're learning so much. And, and and it takes a lot of help, but you don't have to really write your own lesson or anything. They got an easy curriculum to follow along with. There'll always be somebody down in. I mean, uh, there's a lot of lot of help down there to help you and uh, so if you would like to lead one of these kids groups down there in, in uh, children's church I want you to think about that and pray about that because there is nothing I don't believe that you can invest in that's that's any more worthy than teaching a child about the gospel than passing it on to the next generation and so I was asked to elaborate on that this morning I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit do the rest I'm just gonna kind of pass it off to him but if you feel like the Lord's laying it on your heart, and man, I need to step up and do something, but I don't know what it is, then let me. If if, if them kids are, if you're passionate about these kids knowing Jesus, it don't matter if you're cool or not. I want to tell you something. I ain't never been cool a day in my life. Okay, you don't have to have the cool factor to do it. All you gotta do is have a love of Jesus, and uh, you can do it. The second thing I want to talk to you about is the revival. The revival is going to be November the fifth through the eighth. It'll be Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Monday evening and Tuesday and Wednesday evening. And our evangelist's name is Jason Carpenter. I want you to take his name all the way to the throne room from right now to then. Just be lifting him up. He's excited about it. He said, man, I need revival and y'all need revival. And I think the Lord's going to bring about revival. I really do. And we're going to begin to talk about that today. But just be praying up our revival. Invite everybody you know and their mama too. Invite everybody to come to revival. Bring them with you. You know what I mean? And uh, with that being said, if you'd bow with me, I want to. We got special music for every service in the revival. I mean, this revival's going to be good. I mean, you come and prepared to be blessed. That's what I want you to do. When you come prepared to go home with something you didn't get here with, that's what you got to do. All right. Bow with me. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for being a God that blesses us, Lord. And uh, Lord, I just ask you to lay on the hearts of those you've already prepared to lead in children's church. Lord, I ask you to apply to their heart very diligently, but with love and the Holy Spirit. Encourage them and, 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 and nudge them along. Father God, thank you for those who have volunteered and done so much, Father God. Thank you for all these kids that you've blessed us with. And Father, thank you for this revival that's coming up. And Lord, I can look backwards and see how you've been putting this thing together. I want to thank you for Jason, anoint and prepare his heart. Thank you for all the special music that's coming, anoint and prepare their heart to lead us into worship. Father, just thank you for this church. Prepare our hearts for revival. We're going to begin today talking about revival, Lord. I ask you to hide me behind the cross in this message, Lord. Just help me remember what I studied. But Lord, make some things clear to me that they not already clear, Lord. Use it to glorify yourself. Glorify yourself through me, through this day, through this church, and through everybody here. Do what you want to do, Lord, because that's what we're going to talk about today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to begin talking about revival today, and really we're going to begin about talking about preparing our heart for revival. Now, I want to tell you something. I'm a huge advocate that revival is not something you plan, it's something you pray for, all right? Now, I done told you we got it jotted in on the calendar from November the 5th through the 8th, but we have planned revival meetings. We're praying for revival. You follow me? We're, we're planning on revival meetings, but we're praying for revival. Now, Miss Downey told me a cool quote from her mama. I'm going to try to get this right. If I don't, she'll let me know. <laughs> but uh, she said that years ago when they began talking about revival, her mother would say that revival is not something you work up. It's something you pray down. Man, I like that. I'm going to have to 
I mean, I, I've got that in Stoward back here somewhere, you know what I mean? That, that's some heavy stuff. Revival is not something you work up. We, we try to get everybody all worked up. We try to get them excited, you know, like a pep rally. Get them all, get them all ready to go, and that's good. But the reality is, is this is not about an outward experience. It's about a spiritual inward experience. Well, we, we, you know, you ever, you, we, we have those experiences. Ricky said that some people's salvation, and I'm going to, this is a Ricky Catlin quote right here. Some people's so called salvation experience was like a guy wetting his pants with dark britches on. <laughs> it was a warm, tingly sensation, but nobody else knew it. <laughs> now that's Ricky Catlin right there. You can write that down if you want to. In other words, they had a tingly physical little experience going on, but it never changed their life enough that anybody else could ever tell that they'd come in contact with God. Now, as crazy as that sounds, Ricky Kettlett analogy wise, it makes perfect sense, right? It makes perfect sense because sometimes we get caught up in an outward experience, but it's not an inward transition. And what we're praying for is for God to do something in our heart, right? We're, we're asking for God to change us inside that boils over to the outside. And so today I want to read you a story. It comes from Daniel chapter 9. Be turning there if you got your Bible. Daniel chapter 9. And I want to set this up a little bit for you. Now Daniel is a book that if you're not careful, it's hard to understand how long the book goes on. All right? The book of Daniel begins with Jerusalem getting overtaken and the exiles going to Babylon. And that happened in 605 B.C. So for all y'all that like to put the mathematics to stuff, get that hound in your head. 605 B.C. Now Daniel was one of the first to go into Babylon. Daniel was a very young man, probably a teenage boy, when he went to Babylon in 605 B.C. As Daniel chapter 9 takes place, it is now 539 B.C. or really, really early 538 B.C. So if you want to put the mathematics to it, that's 66 to almost 67 years that Daniel has been in captivity under the Babylonians and now the Persians. Daniel has spent the vast majority of his life in captivity, but he is old enough to have remembered what Jerusalem was like. I want you to grasp that, you know. There's a lot of people in this world that remember what the face of America looked like when it was a better America. You've told me those stories. There's a lot of people in this room that said, I remember. And you're looking back to a better thing, something that warms your heart. And Daniel remembers what Jerusalem looked like in its splendor. He remembers Solomon's temple, which was overlaid with gold. Man, Solomon's temple was something to behold. It was immaculate, unbelievable. He remembers Jerusalem and its prime when it was a place that everybody wanted to come and look at because it was God's holy hill. It was the thing that drew all men to it. But as we'll read here in a minute, it ain't that way no more. You understand, they destroyed the temple. They carried off the articles of worship. They destroyed the walls with fire. The, Jerusalem lies in ruins. Daniel, Daniel remembers that. But now, get this, I want you to grasp this because we live in a time where the word is very important right now. I'll get the word out and read it. Daniel is a man who has the word. And in the beginning of Daniel chapter 9, he said, And I know from the writing of Jeremiah the prophet that the time in, for Israel in captivity would be 70 years. You get that? Daniel said, I know Jeremiah said Israel would be in captivity for 70 years and I already told you that they've been there for 66 or 7. Now you put the math to it, the race is about run, right? We about got this thing, whoop! And you would think that Daniel would be so excited with, whoo! I mean, ain't got but about three more years of this hitch, baby, and we go into the house. But that's not the feeling he has. I want you to read with me in Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to begin reading in verse 4, and I'm a slow reader. And somebody told me one time you ain't supposed to read more than 10 verses at a time, and I'm fixing to break that rule. 
So y'all start following along with me there in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 4. And it says this. I prayed to the, this is Daniel speaking. I prayed to the Lord my God and I confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We've been wicked and we've rebelled. We've turned away from your commands and your laws. We've not uh, listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Lord, you're righteous, but this day we're covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all of Israel, both near and far in the countries where you've scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, our princes, and our fathers are covered with shame because we've sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God and kept his laws he gave us through his servants the prophets. All of Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster will come upon us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we've sinned and we've done wrong, O Lord. In keeping with your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and our iniquities of our Father have made Jerusalem and our people an object to scorn to those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, for your sake, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open our eyes, open your eyes, rather, and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not, remake, we do not make request of you because we are righteous. But because of your great mercy, O Lord, listen, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O God, do not delay because your city and, and because of your city and the people that bear your name. Now listen to this verse right here. I'm going to quit in the middle of his thought, but I want to read you this verse. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. Now, Daniel is in the middle of something right here. Now, he's getting ready to get a vision from God about 70 weeks of seven years. He, seven Sabbath, 70 Sabbath weeks of years, 490 years. He's getting ready to get this vision from God. Now, you're going to hear this talked about a lot because it's prophetic toward the end of time. The last of the seven weeks we haven't seen yet. It's, it, it, it's not there. It's, it's yet to be fulfilled. And, and so you're hearing this talked about a lot now about what's going on in Israel. But what I want to talk about this morning is not so much the answer of the vision as the heart in which Daniel prayed before God gave him this vision. Now Daniel is about to get out of Babylon. Whoo, you'd think that would make this old boy elated. But he's not elated. He's not, he's not out there doing the mashed potato, you know what I mean? Doing the weed eater saying, we're getting ready to get out of this joint. He is praying earnestly and with a broken heart, pleading with God to do something. And I, the something is what I want you to get. Now notice in Daniel's prayer, he never asked for God to get him out of anything. I mean, if I was Daniel... I mean, that Daniel's, I mean, he's knocking on 80 if he ain't done when I hire over him. He could be praying things like, God, just please let me live long enough to die in my homeland. That's all I want, God. 
Just let me live long enough not to die in this foreign place. I want to die in the place that I've longed for all my life. Just let me be, let me live long enough to see Jerusalem one more time. He doesn't. He doesn't pray for God to get him back safely. He doesn't ask God to make it easy for him. As a matter of fact, Daniel never makes a single request for Daniel in his prayer. Daniel's prayer is for Jerusalem. I want you to think about it. He never asked for God to do something for the people in the prayer. He asked for God to do something for Jerusalem and, and the people of Israel's sake. Not these, it's not about us here in captivity. It's not about us going through a tough time. It's about glorifying your name by reviving your people Israel and your holy city Jerusalem. Daniel wants God to glorify himself once again through Jerusalem. Now this is what I want you to grasp. I want you to get this. Daniel don't want it to go back to business as usual. Isn't it amazing what happens in our life when we come in contact with a spiritual kind of event and you get those goosey bumps, you know what I'm talking about. Get that wiggly feeling and man, it feels good. And whoo, and you'd wish it never would be this way. But most of the time it ventures back to business as usual, right? And Daniel realizes what good is 70 years in Babylon if we go back the same miserable mess we was when we left. And so he's asking God to restore true temple worship in Israel. Now the answer to his prayer is going to be huge. Now God's going to give him this vision and this vision is going to go far past seven weeks. It's going to be seven weeks a year or, or uh, uh, 49 years until the rebuilding of the temple and the wall. That's the first little series. Uh, God's going to accomplish this great thing Daniel's asking about. He's going to rebuild the temple and the wall. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that God's about to do something that we're still talking about up in here. In less than a year from when Daniel prays this prayer, Ezra will leave in, in 68 I mean in 38, rather 538 B.C., Ezra will take back the first of the people to begin to rebuild the temple. You have to understand that's less than a year after this prayer was prayed. Woo! Don't that make you feel good? I mean, God's up in here, and he's already in process of sending somebody back to start on rebuilding that temple. And then he's going to send good old Nehemiah back. You know, Nehemiah's going to have the same kind of heart Daniel is. He's going to realize that Israel's in ruins and he's going to fall on his face and cry to his God and say, God, my city has no walls. My city has nothing to guard itself. It's vacant. What good is it going to be to build a temple if we can't protect the temple? We have no walls. And he's going to go to our texturist, the king. But before he does that, he's going to ask everybody to pray for favor. If you've read the story of Nehemiah, oh, I like his part. And he's going to go to our texturist, the king. And our texturist is not only going to give him permission to go back and build the wall, but he's going to sign a check on Persian pay for it. Now that's how big my God is. Now God's got plans, but here's the thing. Let me ask you something. What goods temples and walls if you don't have a heart of worship? You understand, Daniel just didn't want a temple. And he just didn't want to walk. Listen to what he says. I'm going to read this verse over to you there. This verse is, is 13 of what I read. He said, just as you've written in the law of Moses, all this disaster came upon us, yet we've not sought the favor of God by turning from our sin and giving attention to your truth. I want you to say that. I want you to hear that. Hear it loud and clear. Daniel said, all this has happened. We've been 66 years in bondage. But we ain't turned back to you yet. Oh, everybody wants to go home. Everybody wants to go back. Lord, everybody wants a new temple and a new wall. But when they get there, they want to glorify their self in it just like we did when we left. You see, they had a beautiful temple. But their worship was glorifying them and not God. They had beautiful walls. But it was to protect their glory, not God's glory. They were all about them, and Daniel was so broken. And the reason he was broken is because he could see that Israel had had no heart change. And he is saying, God, 
change our hearts. But you know how he begins? And that's where I read that verse 20. He said, I was praying. I want you to get this part. I was praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people. Woo, man. How good that you are confessing other people's sin. I mean, when you was a kid and you're and, and your siblings done something wrong, how easy was it to confess their faults? I'm asking you. When your parents come in the room and said, who broke this? And you went, right? who did it? It is so easy to rat somebody else out. It is so easy to look at somebody else and say, I can see their problem. They're selfish. Right? That's easy, man. We can look at, we can see the pride in people. I mean, some people, man, it looks like they're wearing pride like a party hat. You know what I mean? And we say, golly, that guy out there is prideful. And man, if he's got the hat, we got the gazoo. You know what I mean? We, we got pride going in and out here. We can't see it. It's, it's, we're so blind to our fault. And Daniel began, because man, Israel's a mess. Let me tell you something about Daniel. This may be the most righteous guy who bears the name Israel at this time. Daniel's record is flawless. You know any bad on Daniel? Because I've studied the Bible a lot on him. And I tell you what, I can't. I can't really throw no rocks at Daniel. But he realizes, I have sinned against my God. I have sought my favor and not my God's favor. And here, maybe the most righteous man among them is on his face before God, pleading for God to truly turn his heart back to him. That's how revival begins. When you confess your sin and seek your God. That is the beginning of revival. And I do believe that this verse right here was the beginning of a great revival. God's going to begin to answer this prayer, man. Ezra's going to fall right in the notch. Esther's in the notch. Nehemiah's in the notch. I mean, you can just look at a long list of people that God's going to use to bring about this great, awesome revival. But I believe a whole lot of it started with this prayer right here. Because when Gabriel gets there, he says, your request has been answered because you have found great favor with God. You know why he was granted great favor? I want you to get this. He realized who God was and who he was. And he submitted to the truth. I, I, I want you to turn with me, if you would, over to the book of Lamentations. Now, I like this old book right here. And not a lot of... Not a lot of focus gets put on the book of Lamentations, but I want you to read with me in Lamentations chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. Now, the book of Lamentations is accredited to Jeremiah the prophet, and he's called the weeping prophet, so therefore we get the name Lamentations. Jeremiah is a very heartbroken man as he writes. And in the book of Lamentations chapter 3 and in verse 19, I'm going to read down there a short while on over to verse 26. Listen to what it says. Jeremiah says, I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them. I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. Now listen to this part. This one's a good one. You're going to know this one. They are new ever morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, and therefore I wait on him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Now, I love this part. I want you to get this. Now, Jeremiah is also much like Daniel. He's a very righteous-looking guy compared to the rest of the crew. And this is what he says. He says, I remember my affliction and my wondering. Now I want to ask you something this morning. Do you remember how much sin cost you? 
Do you remember the path you walked down when you was on the wrong one? Jeremiah said, I remember my afflictions. Oh, I remember them good. And I remember my wondering. I remember walking and walking and walking and feeling like I would never get anywhere because I didn't know where I was at. Pointlessly, aimlessly living my life. I remember it so good. You know, there's all kinds of different ways to change somebody. One way is to tell them, no, 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 that'll hurt baby. Did your mom ever tell you that? No, 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 baby. Don't do that. Don't lick the plug. Right? That'll hurt baby. Don't do that. No, no, no. And that's a nice way of teaching. Sometimes it's not effective. One time, I've told you this story before, I think. My daddy was putting together a chimney. And he was putting together them old double insulated pipes. You ever food with them dang things? They go up, they'll walk all over you. And he told me, leave them pipes alone. Yeah. And, and he was in the house getting them things up through the chimney, and I got myself one of them pipes. And I went out there, and we had a deck out behind the house, and there's one of them kind that was about this high, you know what I mean? And it had that two before down here. One, two before here in the top rail, that's all it had. That was back before the day when they made you have and not have a hole. A kid couldn't stick their head through. I think I might be the reason for that. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I got me one of them pieces of pipe, and I opened that thing up best I could, and I hooked it over that top rail. And I had myself a horse right there. And then I mounted up. I got up on that two before, and I throwed my leg over that thing. And I was riding and shooting with both hands. And the only thing was is that two before was down in such a way that I could only put one foot on it at a time. I, my legs weren't long enough to put both of them on there. And I don't know what happened, but that horse went one way, and I went the other way. And I went on the side that the ground was on. It was a pretty good little ways down. And when I hit the ground, boy, it hurt. And about the time I got myself pulled together, I looked up, and here come that pipe. And I still got one scar on the back of my head and one on the front because that thing stuck right on my head. <laughs> and here come Daddy with me with a pipe on my head and blood going everywhere. But you know what? He never had to tell me not to fool with one of them pipes no more. <laughs> right there, I got it. Leave the pipe alone. It made perfect sense all of a sudden. And sometimes in our life, I believe God is up there saying, Do you not remember your affliction and your wondering? Do you not remember the last time that you said, I got it, God, let go of my hand. I can walk now. I've got this, God. Just step back and watch. I don't need it. I've got it licked here, God. He said, do you not? Jeremiah said, oh, I remember well. I remember well my affliction and wonder. And this is, listen to what he says. And I know the reason that I'm not consumed. Is because of his great love. God has had every reason to say that's enough. I'm done with that boy. Forget it. But he ain't. And he won't. He's kept on reaching out for my hand. He's kept on with that hand extended to mine. Jeremiah said the reason I have hope is because his faithfulness is without end. Listen to this, his mercy is new every morning. That's one of my favorite verses in this world. Anybody have a bad day this week? I mean, you swung and struck out. Do you ever have one of them kind of spiritual days? You swing with everything you got and the ball goes behind you. We have them days in our spiritual life. Now, as Christians, we like to act like we don't. I want to tell you something. People get religious at church. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, when people's at church, they're religious, man. And when we're at church, man, we, we kind of act like we got it going on. But the reality is some of us this week have swung and missed. 
And when you just absolutely go to bed at night feeling like you're a failure, how do you get up and go again tomorrow if you don't know that God's mercy is new? When you wake up in the morning, he ain't going to say, well, I hope you don't mess up as bad as you did yesterday. i never seen such a mess. I'll be cleaning this up by only 10 years from now what you've done. Huh? That's not God. And Jeremiah says this. Listen to this words. I love this right here. Get you some of this. He says, I say to myself, you ever talk to yourself? If you don't, you'll go crazy. And I've heard all my life, if you're talking to yourself, you're crazy. I beg to differ. If you ain't talking to yourself, you'll go crazy. <laughs> David said in the Scripture, he consoled himself in the Lord. As a matter of fact, let me recount one of them conversations to you. He wrote it down. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Why so downcast within me? Get your head up. You ever have to give yourself a pep talk? Man, have I. And Jeremiah said, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion and he's worth waiting on. I will wait for my God. I will trust in him. Even though it don't look like a complete picture this morning, I'm not letting go of his hand. I'm going to trust in him. I know I messed up yesterday, but his job's to bring me to the other side and I'm going to wait on my God. Jeremiah said, that's the reason I got hope. It's because I know he's my portion. Let me ask you something. What's your portion? What are you living for? I ask myself that a lot lately. You ever ask yourself that? What in the world am I doing this for? What am I doing? I have that conversation with myself a lot. I, I, because I realize something. In my life, I have lived so much of it for my glory. I've done a whole lot of things, not because it really made sense, just because I could say I've done it. You ever do any of those things? Man, is that dumb, but I've done it. Didn't really put the pencil to it before I started out. I just wanted to do it, and I've done it. I can say I've done it, but boy, I wish I hadn't have. You got those kinds of things going on. Self glorification will get you in a lot of trouble. And Jeremiah said, I remember very well my affliction and my wandering. I know what it felt like to walk outside his will. And that's why I'll wait on him. Whew. Let me ask you something this morning. Do you remember your affliction? Do you remember what it feels like to realize that where you are is not where God would have you right now? That you've put yourself in a place that separates you from God. I like hunting. Like hunting's my gig. You know what I mean? I love that. I mean, when I'm there, I, the world goes away. And, and I've been watching these old boys. I'm not advertising here, but if you've ever watched the outdoor show, Limitless Outdoors, it's a Christian outdoor show, and the old boy does a lot of preaching while he's hunting. And I heard him say something the other day that just made all the sense in the world. A little light went off in my head. He said, A lot of people. They tell me sometimes, man, I've been hunting, but I ain't had no luck. And I said, where have you been hunting? And they tell me. And most people want to hunt where they're comfortable. Well, I walked up there on the hill, and I sat under that big shade tree. I had my bologna sandwich there with me, drinking a cold pop. Sitting out there in the dark, looking over the field there, truck right behind me. And I sit there, I sit there for five hours, never seen a thing. He said, you know what, being an effective hunter requires one thing. you got to be in the presence of what you're hunting for. Think about that for a minute. An old fella told me one time, said, everybody wants a big place to hunt. But you'll be a whole lot better off with five acres in the right place than 500 in the wrong one. That made a lot of sense that day. But this guy turned it to Jesus there and that. He said, you know, there's a lot of people that's trying to find God while they're living for the world. And they can't figure out why they ain't got it worked out yet. They're as spiritually comfortable 
as you can make yourself. They haven't strived one time to reach out to God. They haven't give up a thing. They haven't dedicated themselves to anything. And they can't figure out why God is not showing himself to them. I mean, they've been watching TV every night. And God hadn't come on any infomercial and gave them some deep insight. Right? And the whole time their Bible's laying within arm's reach. You get my drift of where he was going? They're looking for God in the easiest place they can find to look. And they haven't found him. And Jeremiah says, I long for God. And I'm willing to wait on him. Now let me tell you something. If you like hunting like I am, and that morning it is so cold that you can no longer feel your feet or hands, the tears that's come out of your eyes didn't make it very far because they froze on your cheek. I've been there. I'm serious. And you ask yourself, why am I doing this? And then all of a sudden you hear that sound rustling in the leaves, you know what I mean? And you hear, she's coming and he's behind her going, oh, 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 oh. And, and all of a sudden you forget about being cold. You don't even know you got hands and feet right now. You know what I'm talking about? Well, let me tell you, if you don't, that's what it is to find what your soul longs for. And when you're longing for God and you're waiting and you say, God, I don't know if I can wait anymore. God, I'm so tapped out. I'm burnt out. I'm, I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, God shows up and he shows himself to you. And all of a sudden, you can charge hell with a water gun. You can feel like you could jump a four-rail fence. You don't know what to do with yourself and you just want to see a little bit more. That's what it means. God, I'm going to wait on you. Right now it's hard and I want to go back to my old ways. But I'm going to wait on you. Last Friday night at the radio station, we read Psalm 73. We talked about good old ass of David's choir director. I, choir director. I love this guy because he's so honest. And he said, I took my eyes off God and I put them on the world. And I got all burnt out and discouraged. And I started questioning even my own faith. You ever done that? Don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. But if you ever got so discontent inside yourself, you started envying the world and questioning your faith. If you ain't, it may be in front of you. Because Satan loves to get our focus off God and on something else. And he said, it wasn't. I had such a hard time understanding to myself, what am I doing until I realized their fate. And I told them this over the radio station. I want to tell you this this morning. I want to ask you, first of all, if it was your last meal, last thing you was ever going to eat, what would you order? I mean, there's some people in here that's like my wife. She never knows what to order. The options jump off the page at her. And like I have no plans to go out to eat next Friday night, but if I do, I know what I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat a steak and a baked potato if they got one. And if they ain't, I'm going to say this is a real place to start a restaurant right here. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what I'm going to eat. And if it was my last meal, I'd get the biggest steak on the menu, baby. How big a rib by you got? Right? That's what I'd order. And, 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 and why? Because I would feed my flesh. I like it. And most of the time, the world's traded the best thing on the menu and gave up the restaurant. You understand, we're going to eat for eternity from the king's table. I, there's already set the wedding supper of the Lamb. I can't wait to eat that supper right there. Whew. Ain't that going to be cool to sit down with Jesus at supper time? Can you imagine Jesus saying, pass them tears? I mean, that's going to be cool. I don't care who you are, that's cool. And I'm going to spend eternity hanging out with the man, you know, the God who spoke the world into existence. But there's so many times that I've been tempted to trade eternity for a momentary delicacy. Because I get my focus all crossed up. 
And Apha said, it wasn't until I realized their destiny that they was going to enjoy for a moment and suffer for a lifetime, eternity rather, that I realized how blessed I am because my eternity is already promised. And he says these words, and I'm going to close with this right here. In Psalm 73 and in verse 25 and 26, he says these words. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Man, I want you to think about something for just a minute. What do you desire? Right now, if I said, what do you want? You can have anything on the menu, but what do you really, really want? You say, man, I, 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 want, I want what you're talking about. I want a relationship with God, but I ain't real sure how to go about it. Because I do believe that that's the place a lot of people's at. I ain't real sure how to progress forward from where I am right here. I'm going to tell you something. You ever noticed how pretty we want to make stuff at church? We want to make sin pretty. As a matter of fact, church, the place where sin is forgiven, most people don't want to mention it. You ever notice that? Oh, sin. That's what the world does. You know, really, sin means to miss the mark. If you've never missed the mark of God, that would put you in the same playing field as Jesus Christ. I'd like to shake your hand after the service is over with. You know what I mean? I mean, it's sin. And we want to make it. Matter of fact, we want to make the cross pretty. I heard this fellow say that the Passions of the Christ movie, they took it too far. They made it a little more brutal than he thought it needed to be. And I said, man, I. Have you any idea what a Roman crucifixion looked like? That was G-rated. They made that about as kiddie as they could make it compared to what a Roman execution would have been because you wouldn't have been able to recognize a man when he got on the cross. Right? Sin ain't pretty, and what it costs to pay for it ain't pretty. And a matter of fact, repentance from sin ain't pretty. When you come to Jesus and you say, Lord, here I am. And sometimes I, I, people, they need to say things like this. Lord, help me believe. And if you're here this morning and you're really struggling with the faith thing and you would be shamed as all get out to get up here and tell everybody, I want to believe, but I don't. I can't get myself where I need to be to trust him. You don't have to get up here and tell everybody, but you need to come to the foot of the cross and say, Lord, help me believe. I remember how that old boy said, I believe, Lord, but heal my unbelief because I'm struggling like crazy. Help me believe. What about this morning if revival, your greatest need is longing for him? Some people ask me sometimes, why is it so hard to get people to work? I say, that's easy. Nobody wants to. Right? They don't long for a job. Used to, people was praying for a job. Now they're praying to avoid one. They don't long for it. Why? Are we not in revival? Because we don't long for it. Help me long for you, God. Help me earn, yearn for you. Maybe this morning that you said, you just, just need to pray that precious song that's written so beautifully. Open the eyes of my heart, God. God, I want to see you. But I feel like I am so bogged down by the world and I feel like I'm so bogged down by the normalcy of life that I just need you to open the eyes of my heart. And this morning, maybe what you really need to pray more than anything is, Lord, help me give all of myself to you. Lord, there's some stuff in my life that I know I need to give you, but I don't know how. Now, I'm going to get real for just a second, and then I'm going to have a hymn of invitation. 58% of Christian men profess to have a pornography struggle. That's in one sin category. Now, I said Christian men, not worldly men. Christian men, when sit down one-on-one, 58% said, I'm struggling. With a fight I can't win. Depression is higher. Just, God, I'm struggling with discouragement and depression inside myself. 
I'm like David. My soul is downcast, and I know I don't have a reason to be, but I don't know how to give it to you. I'm consumed with anxiety. I'm consumed with worry. I've let it rob my joy. I've let it rob my peace, and I have let that keep me from seeking you. And I need to give you this, but I don't know how. Show me how. I need to give you anger and hatred. I have had unforgiveness in my heart for a long time for somebody. Every time I think of them, I end up in a fight with them in my mind. I would like to tear their Adam's apple out and show it to them, God, but I know that I need to forgive them. And the only way in this world I can do it is if you help me because I have tried and tried and I cannot do it. I can't. Now, if you're here this morning and you realize you can't, and he can, then you're in a great, great place for salvation and restoration. But you've got to be willing to be honest and real and seek him. Now, if you know you're lost, and I want to tell you something. I've talked to several people here lately. This is a new thing for me in the ministry who have been honest enough to tell me they're lost. But they're just not ready to get saved yet. And it scares me. I am so thankful that they're honest. I talked to a young man the other day that I've been praying for. I woke up in the middle of the night praying for some others that I've known for a long time. My good friend, Fred Huffman, died this morning. I love Freddie. He was crazy as a bed bug, but I loved him. In the last five or six years, he ain't talked about nothing but Jesus. And this is the cool thing. I knew him when we was on the wrong side of the cross. And I got to be friends with him on the right side of the cross. And he'd call me some days and say, Hey, man, have you seen so-and-so lately? And I'd say, Fred, I can't remember the last time I'd seen him. And he'd always say something like this. Boy, I hope he got saved. Boy, I hope he gets saved. Ain't that what it's all about? As Christians, we better get real and realize that one of these days, it's going to be the last day and the greatest hope we got is getting saved. And if you know you ain't, you say, Lord, I don't know how to do it, and I don't even know if I believe, but I want to. Be honest and pour your heart out to God. Won't you come as we sing our invitation hymn? The only thing that could possibly stand between you and God is want to. If you want to, he's willing. Won't you come?